This is our second week on the subject of the Bible and sexuality. Would really encourage you to check out last week if you missed it. Uh, we're kind of breaking away from our normal pattern. Our normal pattern being teaching an extended passage of Scripture or in teaching an entire book and teaching through it. The reason why we normally do that is what dictates what we study every week is the text in front of us and then the next passage in that text. And normally, we believe that's a healthy, really the best way to approach the Bible, okay? Uh, but instead of doing that, we're doing a short series that's topical on this topic of the Bible and sexuality. And really, it's just two weeks, last week and this week. And so um, we're speaking on a subject, and we're looking at numerous passages that deal with that subject. And so there's a time and a place for topical study, and that's why we're doing what we're doing here. The goal in this has been to make clear and concise statements from Scripture. Statements that are, uh, culturally speaking, controversial, all right? Or even maybe by some considered hate speech, but statements that the Bible clearly makes true and makes known, okay? And understanding that God's design and desire and all of that is love for us, okay? So to review what we talked about last week, the Bible clearly states unequivocally that there are two genders. There's not a spectrum of genders. There are two genders. The Bible clearly states that homosexuality is a sin. The Bible clearly condemns that all sexual activity outside of marriage, right, it's sin. The Bible condemns that, okay? And, of course, the good news is that Jesus died for all sexual sinners like you and me. Okay, now something that cannot be emphasized enough when we talk about the Bible and sexuality, is that God is not anti-sex, okay? It was his idea. He's the designer of it. He's the creator. He's the giver of that gift. Well, why are there so many warnings or prohibitions in Scripture? Because there are so many ways we're constantly just driving off a cliff when it comes to sex and sexuality. So God's not a big old meanie. God is not a cosmic killjoy. We are meant to enjoy the gift of sex in marriage, one man, one woman, in the covenant of marriage. God's desire and his design is for that, okay? He specifically designed it that way, and he's our creator, all right? So we must understand that, that God is for us, right? He's for us enjoying all of his good gifts. Where does Satan come into play? Satan comes in as the twister and the corrupter of God's good gifts. He creates nothing. He only destroys. He only corrupts. Okay, so we understand that sex is a gift from God, and it's his idea, and he designed it for our good and for our enjoyment, and he designed that that would take place in marriage, okay? So today, a few more concise statements from Scripture, and then a way forward, all right? So what do I mean by way forward? I mean, how are we to proceed? as Christians in a culture that is just rapidly continuing to defer from God's plan on sex and sexuality. And we need to understand the way forward. We need to think about it because quite frankly, uh, the way many of us, like Christians culturally in the States, are behaving, at best it's not working, and at worst it's unacceptable. So two clear statements from Scripture on the Bible and sexuality, and then a way forward, all right? So let's start with this. Here's the next clear, concise statement from Scripture, that God designed marriage for one man and one woman. God designed marriage to be between one man and one woman. Now, right from the top, look, right from the top, people will try to jump on that statement. Are you sure about that, Jason? You, are you sure that that was God's design? Because Jason, like, like it's a trick, like how many wives did Abraham have? right? How many wives did Jacob have? What about King David? Right? What about King Solomon? All of them major players in Israel's history, all of them with many, many wives. So are you sure about that? Aren't you just being hypocritical? And the answer is yes, I'm sure about that, without a doubt. Here's two passages of Scripture to start, okay? Genesis chapter 2 is where I had you turn. Look at verse 18. Here's the creation account. We talked about this from a different perspective from the role of gender last week. But here is also God establishing like the covenant of marriage. All right? Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother, hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Right? So God, God is 
kind of created and defined for us what marriage is and what happens in marriage, that it's between one man and one woman, and as they join together in marriage, they become one flesh, all right? So fast forward all the way to the New Testament, to Jesus, all right? Matthew chapter 19, okay, verse 4. He answered, Jesus speaking here, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning, Jesus is referring to the Genesis account, okay? He made them male and female. And he said, therefore, a man shall leave his father, his mother, and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What God has joined together, let not man separate. So we see here that marriage is, defined by God, established by God. Marriage is God's good gift. It was his idea. We didn't come along and create this. He did, and he gave it to us, and he established the parameters of what healthy marriage looks like. And it starts with one man, one woman, right from the beginning. Then Jesus reconfirms that in Matthew. So we were talking last week about like the heresy of the red-letter Christians that are kind of like we only follow the red letters of Jesus as if somehow that contradicts the rest of Scripture, and it doesn't, right? But here's Jesus, red letter Christians, here's Jesus defining, right, and setting the definition and the barriers for what real marriage looks like. Established in creation, Jesus confirming that in the New Testament. Many other places in the Bible. There's two examples for you. Now, in between Genesis chapter 2 and Matthew 19, especially in the Old Testament, which is often written in narrative form, like story form, storytelling. In between Genesis 2 and Matthew 19, we have example after example of men who thought they knew better, of men who were like, yeah, I know what God said, but I think I got a better way. I think it'd be fun to to take a bunch of women as my wife, right? Have a bunch of wives. I think that would be a great idea. And the Bible doesn't shy away from it. It shows us them doing it, and it shows us the consequences. So you have this clear statement from Scripture in Genesis 2, right? God designed marriage for one man, one woman. It has always been controversial. You understand that, right? That definition of marriage has always been controversial. People have always bucked against it. Today, it's controversial primarily because it excludes same-sex marriage. But for really, like, the last, like, 10,000 years is controversial because it excluded polygamy. It excluded uh, misogyny, men just being allowed to take as many women as they want to use and to push them aside. So this statement has always been controversial. As culture changes, it's controversial for different reasons, okay? But it always has been, right? So what about all these stories of these Old Testament patriarchs, right? Right? Some of them described like as men after God's own heart, marrying these many wives. Is the Bible, what is the Bible doing there? Is the Bible saying it's okay? Is the Bible giving them a pass? And we have to understand the way much of the Old Testament's recorded. It's story form. It's narrative. In most good stories, if you're like a reader, even if you watch a great show that's, that's, that's telling this story like through episodes that build on each other, okay, good stories don't typically stop with a narrator and say, this was bad. This was a terrible decision. The story shows you, through the telling of the story, the consequences for their decision. Okay, and so the Bible is one book, but it's made up of different types of literature. And Old Testament narrative and story form does that very thing. Sometimes, sometimes we have a word from God in the middle of it, that God was displeased, God's anger was kindled, but many times we don't. Okay? And so, uh, in great storytelling, you see how the consequences play out. So when people say to me, see, the Bible is fine with polygamy. I'm just like, have you read any of those accounts? Have you read any of those examples that you're citing? Because it's obvious that you haven't. In every single instance, it's total pandemonium, total chaos, total just sin and consequences. What happens when Abraham takes multiple wives? Isaac and Ishmael are born from separate women. The rift of them being born and being born from separate women and the idea who the child is, the child is of the promise. That rift continues to the Middle East to this day. Like how can you not read Abraham and see that there are consequences for his polygamy? It's all over the Bible. It's all over the news. 
to this day. Well, let's go on to Jacob. What about Jacob, who another patriarch that took multiple wives? The entire story of Joseph, one of most Christians' favorite stories in the Old Testament, the entire story of Joseph's betrayal by his brothers centers around the fact that he's the favored son from the favorite wife. They despise their dad because he, he has a son that, that's favored over them, and they despise their dad because he has a favorite wife that's not their mama, and they're defending their mama. And so they hate Joseph, they take it out on him, and they sell him into slavery. It's, his brothers hated him for that. Joseph's ordeal is almost entirely the result and the consequences of Jacob's disobedience of God's design for marriage. Jacob decided, I know what God said, but I'm going to do it anyways. Let's go to King David, one of David's own sons from a less favored wife, which is ridiculous to even say that, but, it, but it's exactly true. Took the kingdom from him, raped his half-sister, brought this great shame on David and his family and the kingdom. All of that, the results of consequences and fallout from polygamy. And then King Solomon. King Solomon had upwards of 1,000 wives, 700 wives, 300 concubines. I'm going to tell you this. I was there yesterday. His Starbucks bill alone would be punishment enough. Like every day. Can you imagine being behind that dude in Jerusalem Starbucks? I'd like 174 decaf lattes with one pump of vanilla. That's actually Ginger's order that I remember now. Okay? I'd like, uh, I'd like 235 pink drinks with no ice but ice on the side because then you get more pink drink and you can put it in. Right? Not to mention the cost. Like, I've rolled in there before and asked for a napkin and it costs $6. Like, that's his punishment every day. Okay? But seriously, though, what are we told about Solomon? the wisest man to ever live. We're told that he married many foreign wives. He did this for reasons like, you know, to advance the kingdom and to make deals. And these foreign wives worshiped foreign gods and they turned his heart from God to worship idols. In every single instance, the Bible shows these men going outside of God's design for marriage, and then the Bible shows the consequences and the fallout for them going outside God's design. In every single instance, men of faith believing that they know God, know better than God. So you have God clearly declaring, this is how I designed marriage to work. And then you have multiple examples in the Bible of men, men of faith even, who are like, ah, I think I know better than God. I'm going to go with my instincts on this one, right? To quote uh, the guy from Dumber Dumber, right? Uh, so you have the Bible then recording the chaos, the consequences, the fallout, the hatred from all of this sin. And it's everywhere. God designed marriage for one man, one woman. The question we must ask ourselves is, do I believe God? Do I trust his design, right? Do I believe him? Do I believe him when I've got the decision, well, maybe I could save money, right, as a college student and just live with my girlfriend for a while, and then we'll get married down the road so we can have a really big Instagram-worthy worthy wedding. Do I believe him when God says, no, don't do that. That's not how I designed marriage. Do I believe him? That's what we have to ask ourselves. Every time I sin, whatever the sin is, every time I sin, the answer is no. I don't believe God. I don't believe God has a better way. Every time I sin, I, I choose to believe the lies of the devil. I choose to believe the lies of my own desires over the promises of God. Every time I sin, it's because I love something else. I want something else more than God. And yet, mercifully, relentlessly, God is pursuing us, ready to reconcile us through his son, Jesus. What a magnificent, long-suffering merciful God we have. Clear and concise statement number one, God designed marriage to be between one man and one woman. Second thing, okay? Second clear and concise statement. Our desires are not natural, okay? And you see what I mean by that in a second here, but our desires are not natural. One of the strongest, and it's, a, it's really an argument that appeals to emotion, Okay, most emotional arguments made, especially when it comes to like the pursuit of same-sex desires, the pursuit of maybe transgender ideology, is that God made me this way. And as for as long as I can remember, I've had these feelings. So that I consider these feelings to be part of me. 
I've liked as a boy. I've liked other boys for as long as I can remember. For as long as I can remember, I've always been a man trapped in a woman's body. I don't know any other way. And so this is who I am. I feel this deeply. I was born this way. This is important theology for us to understand, okay? I'll give you an example. A few years back, a viral video of a 12-year-old girl in a Mormon church during what they have, they have this faith and testimony time. And this 12-year-old girl, she has her coming out, right? Like she, she's coming out uh, as a lesbian in this faith and testimony meeting, and she says these very things. God made me gay, and it's not a mistake, right? And so, well, how do you respond to that? That's a really good way to frame things. God made me this way, right? Who are you to condemn that? God would want me to be happy. Why don't you want me to be happy? This is where we need to understand this clear, strong statement from Scripture that our desires are not natural. What do you mean by that? I mean this. God made you. God made Jason. But sin has corrupted all of us. Sin has touched every part of creation, and sin has touched every single one of us so that all of us are sinners. And so because sin is corrupted, God made us, but sin has corrupted us, and it's corrupted all of us, including corrupting our desires. So sin has twisted every single one of us. You want some scripture for it? Let me show you this. We'll put it on the screen. I'll kind of go through them here slowly but quickly. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. Sin has touched us so much that none is righteous. Not one. The only way we receive righteousness is through the blood of Jesus Christ. No one is righteous. No one will stand before the Father on the last day and be like, I was a good person. My good works outweighed my bad. No. None is righteous. Not one. So much so, verse 23 of Romans 3, all have sinned, and because of that sin, they fall short of God's glory. So sin has touched every single one of us. There isn't a single one of us that isn't a sinner that wasn't born in sin. Romans chapter 5, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and death spread to all men because all sin. All right, Here's just, these are just a few examples of how over the top the Bible explains that we are all sinners and we are sinners from birth. 1 John chapter 1, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. That's how strong John is about the sin that's in all of us. So we have to understand, right, from, from the Bible clearly teaching us, from a theological perspective, that sin touches every single one of us. And it touches every part of creation. Right, we've talked about this in other ways, right, and how, like, we don't even experience like the good gifts that God gives us of food and sight and touch. All of that's corrupted by the fall. We, we will truly see for the first time in the new heaven and the new earth when sin is completely eradicated. We have never seen a sunset like God intended it to be. We've never seen the Rocky Mountains like they were originally created. Everything's been touched by sin. You have never tasted bacon like it was even supposed to taste, and that's amazing, right? All of it. Sin has touched everything. So it touches every one of us, every part of us, including our desires. So some of our desires that come so naturally that maybe we've had them for as long as we can remember that feel natural, they are due to the corruption of sin, and they are contrary to God's design. This is so common, in fact, that the Bible warns us over and over again about simply following the desires of our heart. Because sin has corrupted and touched everything, the Bible's like, don't follow your heart. Now, the culture says that. The culture says, trust your heart. It'll never lead you astray. We all know that's not true. How many times have we all followed our heart? Right? Like the total just mess, right? That's what the culture says. It will never lead you astray. The Bible, on the other hand, because our desires are corrupted, the Bible has this thing, this to say about the heart. Jeremiah chapter 17. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Matthew chapter 15. From out of the heart come evil thoughts. Murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. Proverbs 28, a great one. 
And the world says, trust your heart. Proverbs says, whoever trusts in his own mind, his own heart in some translation, is a fool. But he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. So because sin has touched every single one of us, because sin has corrupted even our desires, there are desires, and they may be different ones, but there are desires that each of us feel, right, that are not what God intended. They feel natural, but they are not natural. So each and every one of us have desires that feel natural, that come easy, that are completely outside of God's plan and outside of God's will. As one writer says, our nature as we currently experience it is not natural. It's not as it is intended to be. God made me. Yes. Right? And that beautiful 12-year-old girl that came out to a Mormon church, my heart goes out to her. because She's part of a church that's full of heresy and she will get no help there. Okay? My heart goes out to her, and God made her. She is an image bearer. Every single person on the planet was made in the image of God. Straight, trans, homosexual, lesbian, whatever. Every single person made in the image of God. Beautiful image bearers. God made me, but sin has corrupted me. So think of, it, think of sin as like an outside agent. Because of our own choices, this outside agent has been introduced, and it's tainted and twisted and scarred everything. One of those unnatural desires that feels natural is same-sex attraction. The Bible in Romans chapter 1 calls the very idea of same-sex attraction contrary to nature, contrary to God's design. The Bible is so unequivocally clear about that. But you talk to somebody genuinely wanting to learn from them with those desires, and they'll explain that they've had those desires maybe for as long as they can remember, and it feels natural. Listen, a lot of things feel natural, but they're not what God intended. The, the, the mantra is be true to yourself, and it sounds really good, but we don't even practice that consistently in our own culture. So the man who comes out to his family as gay and he leaves his wife and he leaves his kid for his homosexual lover, true story, multiple occasions, leaves them, leaves them to their own to fend for themselves. He's not condemned for his unfaithfulness to his wife or for abandoning his kids. Rather, he's praised because he's being true to himself. But apply that same standard if the man leaves his wife for a much younger model. Most view him as a scoundrel. Why isn't he being true to himself? Why wasn't he just born that way that he was attracted to younger women and, quite frankly, his wife's aged out? Why? You can't. Because reasons, Jason. Exactly. There are no reasons. There's no consistency there. You understand? Even in our own culture, we don't apply that uh, consistently. Look, we talked about this last week because the answer would come down to, but they feel this strongly. I feel it. I was born this way. You can feel something strongly and feel it deeply down in your bones, and it still doesn't make it true, okay? Dallas Cowboy fans go through this every year, okay? Yeah, there goes Ryan. Sorry, man. Just hitting home. This is the year. I feel it. C.D. Lamb, this is it. Right. What if the constant schoolyard bully fell back on that. God made me this way. As long as I can remember, I like punishing other kids and taking their stuff. Right? Well, well, no, that doesn't count. That doesn't count because that's not like one of the colors of the rainbow, like bullying. It doesn't get added in there. That one doesn't count. Why doesn't it count? Why can't he make the same argument? I feel this strongly. It's what I've always done. God wants me to be happy, and this will make me happy. This fallen nature that I'm talking about, Look, you know where you see it like as clearly as anything? It's in toddlers. Toddlers, man. I'll I'm going to tell you something that I never realized. Toddlers are like cats, okay? That means, what do I mean by that? I mean that if they were big enough, they'd probably kill you, right? That's what toddlers are. And I love toddlers. I, that's one of the best ages for our kids, the boys, the twins, when they were little at that age, man. It was so much fun. But at the same time, there were moments where, like, if they're big enough, I think they might kill me. If they could, hit, if they could throw that block harder, I think they would right? You see it in children. 
Man, I, I've told this story before, but I remember clearly with my boys, they were just starting to walk. It was just like uh, right around their first birthday, and Ginger was out shopping, and, we, and I was on the phone with her, and they were standing by our front door, and Brady had a toy, and Caleb took the toy from Brady, and it's the first time I've ever seen it. Brady just so easily and naturally just slapped Caleb across the face, and, uh, and Caleb didn't like cry and fall down. He got mad. And so he slapped Brady across the face and took it back. And I'm talking to Ginger, and I started doing this, and she's like, what's funny? I'm like, well, the boys, they're slapping each other for the first time. And she's like, be the dad and stop them. And it's like, oh, yeah, okay, all right. All right, I got it, yeah, all right. But I was so taken aback by, they had never seen that. I never slapped them. They'd never seen anybody do that. It was so natural for them. You took that, I'm mad, I want it back, I'm going to smack you for it. And I'm going to keep doing that until I get it. All of us, all of us have desires for things that God has forbidden. I had to help, I helped in a counseling situation with a grown woman years and years ago in another state who for as long as she could remember, a woman of means struggled with kleptomania, just taking things. And so a grown woman in a very nice house getting busted for shoplifting, right, in it's just a desire and something that she's always had for, for reasons that go deep. But she's, as long as she can remember, she's done this. She has no reason to steal, but she does all of us. It may be as simple as, like, tough situation, and I'm just lying my way out of it. Just lying my way out of it. It comes easy. It flows. I'm just lying to cover my tail. All of us, all of us have desires for things that God has forbidden. It was perfectly natural for my boys to smack each other. They'd never seen it or been on the receiving end. It flowed from their sinful heart, but it wasn't right. This is a result of us having a fallen nature. What we feel is not natural because of sin in all of us. We all desire things that God has forbidden. It's a reflection of how sin has twisted us, and this is where Jesus comes in. And Jesus saves you. He begins the process of changing you, of shaping you. God, through the Holy Spirit, begins to transform your life, remaking you into the image of Jesus. We call this process sanctification. It's growth in the Christian life. Sometimes it's exciting and it's a lot of fun. And sometimes it's difficult because God's breaking the grip of sin in our life. And God's breaking the grip of idols that we worship instead of him. The good news is that God, he starts that process at salvation, and he promises to finish it. And ultimately, every single Christian will celebrate forever on the new heaven and the new earth with no more unnatural desires, no more desires that you have to fight. None of that, none of that sin nature. And that's all because of Jesus. So, so look, we'll stop there with those two clear, concise statements of Scripture. The last one being, look, our feelings, as we feel, are, they're not natural. And I want to give you a way forward. And this is kind of building on last week, talking about the culture that we're in and, and the schools all our kids go into and just pushing agendas about sex and sexuality that the Bible just condemns. And the Bible says there's a better way. Well, what do we do about that? Well, how do we live? What's the way forward? I just want to give you two, like, two just really quick ideas. This isn't exhaustive. This isn't everything. But these are difficult, divisive times. So how is a Christian to live in a culture that is so hostile to the truth? How are we to interact with people in a culture that believes things so fundamentally different than we do? Work, school, family. Then on top of that, it seems like our country is more polarized around politics right now than perhaps it's been at any time since maybe the 60s or 70s. So how's a Christian supposed to live? What are we to do? And I want to just give you two quick ideas, not exhaustive, but two things if we could focus, man, by the grace of God, we could start to make a little difference in our little corners of the world. The first one is this. Live in peace. Live in peace with your neighbor. Live in peace with your coworker. All right, this is, listen to Paul in Romans chapter 12. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Do not overcome evil, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's 12 verses 18 and 21. This little challenge from Paul is especially powerful when you consider his original audience. They were Christians who were suffering intense 
life-altering, life-threatening persecution. Many of them that were still living had seen friends and loved ones being hung on crosses and lit on fire, burning Roman streets, lighting them up, fed to lions, everything you can imagine. And here's Paul saying, if it's possible, as much as it depends on you, you can't control the actions of other people, but you can control you. Live peaceably. Don't, over, don't be overcome by evil. Overcome evil with good. So Paul's challenge to them and to us is to, if at all possible, live at peace. Not to be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This would be a way, even right now, for a Christian to leave a real mark on a hateful, polarized world. A world that has really no concept right now. Like, if you don't agree with me completely, then we're at odds and we hate each other. What an easy way for a Christian to be different. Find a way in the power of the Spirit to live in peace. Let me give you one example. Let's talk about cancel culture for a second. Kind of familiar with that now, right? You're familiar with cancel culture and what's happening? What's the idea? The idea behind cancel culture is withdrawing support or canceling somebody or some company after they have done something or said something that's deemed offensive. And the goalposts are always moving. So even people that were canceling other people a year ago are now themselves being canceled. This is cancel culture. And now we kind of look at that and we're like, yeah, those snowflakes, they're losers. And we kind of associate it with them. But I want to point out that Christians have been using those same tactics for years. I grew up in the 80s and 90s in the church during the political movement of the moral majority. The, one of the purposes of the moral majority was to attempt this very thing. To use like your power. You're either for us or you're against us. And you don't want to be against us because we have this moral majority of people. And we've got numbers and we've got lots of people. And we can make your business succeed or we can make it fail. We've been practicing that for a long time in the broader church. Not to mention things like canceling restaurants that sell alcohol. Canceling Disney for like 37 reasons. Uh, man, there was, there was this one guy in the church that always had something he was fighting right? And so I'm wearing jeans, and he comes up to me, and Lee jeans, huh? They give money to the gays. I can't believe you'd wear that. And I'm just like, these are the only ones that come in husky size, you know? Like, I just, I just, you kids, like, have no idea what it was like in the 80s and 90s if you were a little husky. Like, you walked into a store, my mom would ask the nearest employee, where are the husky jeans? They would go to the, 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 um, the loudspeakers, yeah, we got a mom here with a son who's about in sixth grade, and he needs husky jeans. Do we know where the husky jeans are, right? Like, this was my life, okay? This is my life growing up. Chick-fil-A, Target bathrooms, Starbucks, because they're commies, they took our plastic straws, and we have this long history of our own cancel culture as Christians. How's that worked out? It's failed miserably. Perfectly fine to choose where you spend your money. Perfectly fine and wise to do that. But organizing a posse, organizing a pressure campaign, that is, that is not the way, folks. The way forward is not to return evil with evil. The way forward is not to cancel because they're trying to cancel. The way forward is attempting to live peaceably with all men. At this time in our culture, what, how, what, what an impact it could be simply like, no, I come to your store, I don't, I, not because I agree with you, but I love your food and you run a great place and that's cool. I just want a good meal. That's a Christian distinctive. How can I live in peace even with a dang mask? during a pandemic, and what's going to be a nasty political year? How can I live in peace? Let's ask ourselves that. Let's consider that. Let's think about the way forward. Here's the second thing, all right? For a thousand reasons, less social media, more face-to-face. -face. Now, it's hard. It's hard because, because of quarantine, because people are scared, and we're wearing masks, and we're distancing. But, folks, social media is killing us. It's destroying our Christian witness, part of a large Facebook group of pastors, like a large group, and I'm just a stalker on there. I just read, and it's one of the recurring fears and concerns about pastors is how what social media is doing to just drive us all apart because we're not seeing each other face to face. So we immediately assume from any comment that isn't just like, oh, you're the best person ever. I just love you so much. We immediately assume like they hate us. They got to be a commie, right? Like they hate us. We assume that. 
our people interact in the virtual world so much, and so much of the virtual world's antagonistic. It causes the person right, to be attacked, detached from the account. So we'd say things that we'd never say in person. The distance is destructive. We know this. It's destructive for teens and adults. It robs us of joy. It robs us then of the strength to have real conversations in person. I can't deal with people. Why? You deal with people a bunch face-to-face? Well, no, but people online are terrible, and so I can't deal with people like in the real world. No time or energy for face-to-face with people because our time and energy has been spent in the virtual world, and it's killing us, and I mean that we're in serious trouble. This week, the CDC, this week, 25% of Americans, 18 to 24, considered suicide in the past 30 days. 25%. 16 percent of age 25 to 44 there is a lot of pain there's a lot of despair there's a lot of depression and isolation and all we're doing on social media is encouraging it just posting vengeful hateful stuff mocking and deriding everybody that doesn't see things like us mocking and deriding half the country and yes other people do it but we're different we've been called to a different lifestyle Social media, the other thing that social media does is highlight the worst events, the most extreme cases through viral videos. And so you begin to think like, oh, you know, like everybody in Seattle is like those Antifa people. Everybody in Texas chews straw, right? You know, like that's what you begin to think because of the worst, and the people of Walmart, like they actually have coloring books for that now, right? Like social media highlights the worst examples in a nation of 330 million people, and we get a video a week from it, and then we're like, yep, all them people are just like that. And we begin to hate them and despise them, people that Jesus loves and that he died for. We grow in our disgust. They're not even people. They're animals. We've been called to something different. Listen to this from, from Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2. You are a chosen race. Talking to believers, you're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Why? Why are we that? That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. What a powerful passage. You were not a people, but now because of Jesus, you're God's people. Once you did not receive mercy, but now you have received mercy. And why did God do this? Verse 9, that you may proclaim, that you may tell other people about the excellencies, the grace, and the mercy of Jesus who offers forgiveness to everyone who comes to him. What are we to do with that mercy? And that's salvation. We're to tell everybody who will listen. One of our responsibilities is trying to tell other people about Jesus. And it's hard to do that when we despise them and post our disgust about them and their ilk on social media. Behind the homosexuality, the transgender, the politics are real people. Real people who many of them have considered suicide in the last 30 days. So what's the way forward for us? The way forward for us is less social media and finding a person face-to-face. I'm going to find you, and I'm going to care about you. As hard as it is to care about you, I'm going to care about you. Real people, people that Jesus loves intensely, who don't know what forgiveness looks like, who don't know what mercy looks like. They're wrapped up in a culture right now where anything can get, make you an outcast and nothing redeems you. Man, Christianity offers a better way. 1 Peter 3, 15, in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. But do it with gentleness and respect. What a word. Again, to persecuted Christians. But he assumes, he assumes here that people will ask you about the hope within, that there's something about you because you're living peaceably when other people aren't. Because you love intensely and intentionally when other people don't, he assumes that you're going to be asked what's different. Why are you like that when other people aren't? You have hope. Why do you have hope? And so one of the things I read that, I'm like, well, when's the last time somebody's asked me about the hope that's within me? Right? Maybe it's been a long time since I've been asked that. Maybe the reason for that is I don't live like I have any hope. I don't live any different than the pagans. 
less social media, more face-to-face -face with real people. Let's look at them through the eyes of Jesus and tell them about the God-man from Galilee. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we pray for grace and love to give the healing news of the gospel, a gospel that reconciles, that calls people to repentance and brings them into the family. So we pray, Lord, for grace to do that, to let that be on our lips, let it be our battle cry, to see people for who they are. We pray, Lord, for grace to live peaceably with people that are hard to live peaceably with. We confess that. It's difficult. We confess our failure at it. And we pray, Lord, for grace to live differently. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.